friction, they said, right? Friction. How many seconds? Off? 20? is my bubble, I'm doing that, but you know, whatever, Jonathan. Exactly, right? Is that 20 seconds yet, Paul? I lost count. <laughs> okay, Andrea, take that and maybe move there. To, and um, you may have to back up uh, just so that some people can see you. Here's our screen right here, just so you know that. Actually, that's the camera too, by the way. So the camera's right above you. So, hi everybody online. Uh, so we have been praying about something, and that what we've been praying about is how do we use this corner to show the love of Christ to this community? And as a part of that prayer, we've been saying, believing that God wants us to get somebody who can be a minister of outreach, who can guide our outreach from this corner into this community. God has given us this corner as a pivotal location. Uh, look, if we... <laughs> With the Governor Newsom's orders, where would we be today? Yeah. You'd all be relaxed at home, watching from your bed in your pajamas. Instead, those of you who are here are able to worship with other people. It's the way God intended it, to be actually face-to-face. -face. Just remember, wear your mask when you're face-to-face. -face. So I'm trying to give you a little social distancing <laughs> there. Okay. But, but um, we're, we're in the final stages of praying about uh, Andrea and, and and whether God is calling her to be our minister of outreach with the responsibility of managing the coffee shop, using the coffee shop as a tool for ministry in this community. Um, Andrea Pusikian, am I saying it right? Okay, good. Andrea Pusikian, that, that means she's um, um, German. <laughs> close, close. <laughs> All right, turn her up a little bit, so get, get, her, get her volume good. Go ahead, let's see if you speak into that. Yeah, that's... <laughs> Yeah. It's Armenian, for, just for the record. That's <laughs> not German. Not German, yeah, no, I know, I know. no, close, but no. Um, yeah, really, um, if we had time, but Andrea is just here from work and has to go back up to work. She works at? Thousand Pines, right? As? As the recreation manager, um, which I oversee a bunch of different venues, including our coffee shop up at camp. And our, our whole purpose is to help create an atmosphere where campers feel like they can have fun and be included and involved and try new and exciting different things. Um, but a lot of that, I think, transfers over to the coffee shop, too. So, Pretty yeah. Much. yeah. Is. And so she is literally taking care of ministering, managing how many people when it's full? When we're full, full, anywhere between 30 to 35. Okay, so there's a few less staff here. Yeah. But here... As a minister of outreach, who will she be helping to manage? Okay, y'all too quiet this morning. Who all will she be helping to manage? Yeah, louder. All of us, right? Are you guys responding? Yeah, we are. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Okay, just a minute. I need to give a little more Holy Spirit in here. Okay. So, so, um, so. I've asked Andrea today because just a few minutes that she has here with us, uh, just to tell us some of the thoughts that she has of how could we show the love of Christ, that's our, that's our mission here, to show love of Christ through this coffee shop to this community. So I'm going to let you talk, Great. and then when you have to go, run. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like Bill said, he just wanted me to share my thoughts on outreach and what the coffee shop could be used for, and I've heard it said before of coffee shops are the modern day wells. They're the place of gathering where communities come around and, and it serves a purpose, whether that's to just commune with one another, to, um, to have conversation, to be filled with water or coffee, uh, thank you, and, um, and just interacting with people. And so I love that picture and that's kind of how I, I saw like, the vision that God gave me for um, for higher grounds as well. So I started reading through through um, John chapter four um, with Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well, right? And we're not going to hold do a whole um, sermon on it, but that the the basis is Jesus goes to this well. He's going through um, Smyrna. He's on his way to Galilee, and he stops um, not Smyrna. Sikar, sorry, and there's a there's a Samaritan woman there at the well, and he he approaches her as a Jewish man approaches the Samaritan woman and says, 
will you will you get me some water and he humbles himself in that and just starts this conversation with a person that he may or may not have um, culturally done it if he was anyone besides the Lord right and it takes her back and it opens this conversation up where he then eventually um, tells her that he is the wellspring of life that the sins that she has in her life she should walk away from and then she turns and follows goes out to her community and says he is the Messiah come follow him as I'm following him right and there's so many different points in that where not only does he break cultural barriers which I don't know about you, but being a Christian isn't the most popular thing right now. But coming to a coffee shop and just being open for conversation and beginning to have those relationship building moments are really, really easy to do. And so how cool would it be if us as Christians are intentional with that, with the regulars that come through the shop, um, with, the, with the weekenders, with the flatlanders, whatever you want to call them that come up, right? How cool is it that we have that opportunity to to bridge that gap between the church building and and the capital C church that can just be right here? Um, so I see that happening, right? I see. Um, oh, it's double sided. There we go. Um, when he speaks life into her and he and he tells her the goodness of the gospel, right? I can see that happening. I kind of picture it happening right on this stage of doing pointed gospel message presentations and giving people the, res the, the chance to respond to those things, you know? Of course, we want to do the, the fun things, right? The things that get people attracted and excited about coming to the coffee shop, right? But if the gospel message isn't preached, then we're just another fun thing, you know? Um, but I do want to incorporate both. Um, so I see... Bible studies happening, multi-generational Bible studies happening, men's groups, women's groups, young adults groups, which I feel like this mountain is desperately in need for, right? Just deeper community and getting into the word and searching that. And that's something that I can't do on my own, right? Um, so I, I do, I see that being a united team thing that, that could happen, that could happen really, really well. Um, but I do see things like mommy and me groups. I want to call it jungle java. We've got like kids going crazy, right? And mom, the kids don't have a caffeine. The moms get it though. And just pouring into moms and saying, hey, how can we come alongside you? What do you need? How do we become a support group and a place that is safe for everyone to come to, right? Um, and then more fun things like I personally, I love bingo and I love trivia. So if I get the chance to run either of those things out here, I'm a happy camper. Uh, it's, I think it's just a good thing for the community to have, you know, family-friendly events that are, again, leading to relationship building. Um, and then as you go through further through that story of Jesus at the well, um, you know, he does, he calls her out on things that might feel uncomfortable, right? But that's part of Christian living. As my brothers and sisters, I, I kind of expect you to hold me accountable to different standards because that's what, that's what God calls us to, right? A life of pursuing holiness. And that happens through community, through relationship. And I see that happening very, very easily here. Um, yeah, so, so the, the part of the story where she then goes out and he, she says, not only did he tell me everything I've ever done, he had insight. I thought he was a prophet, but really he is the Messiah. Um, but she goes out and she goes to the people that she's connected to, right? And there's this multiplication of this woman that they know, they see life change in her. And because of that, they then come and they listen to who Jesus is and the, the teachings and the preachings that he had. And then... This whole little village of Samaritans is now saved and they are followers of Jesus. And that's my prayer for this mountain. Um, I know I know that God is moving on this mountain, that he has big plans for it. And I know that, you know, activities that we can do, they can be fun, like I said, but if but if we allow Jesus to come in and the Holy Spirit to do the work that he has set to do, um, that that this place and that Christ Life First Baptist can really be a part of that, 
what I see is a movement on this mountain of the lost being saved, finding hope, finding finding new life in Jesus. So that's it. Is there anything else you want me to share? Or I don't know if there's well, questions or. Well, what's your time period? I probably got about 10 more minutes. 10? Yeah. To get there or. No, I could spend 10 here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, one thing that I'd like you to do is I'd like you to pray about what you just said. Oh, absolutely. Uh, because it's, it's very clear that, that God wants us to build the relationships with people so that they can come to know Christ. And he gave us this facility as a tool, a resource, and, and we've got to use that. So I'd like you, I'd like you to yeah. lead us in prayer for that, okay? Okay. Please. Abba Father, I just, I thank you for the ground underneath our feet. The, the well that you have placed here, God, on this mountain. And I just pray over it, Lord, um, that your Holy Spirit is seen and known and felt here, that, that believers that are on this ground will be filled with you to then share your love and share your gospel to those that need it the most. Um, God, we know that if outside of your will, nothing we do matters. So, so we do ask that um, if I am the candidate that is moving forward, that, that, you, that it is honoring and blessing and in your will, God, and that you make that clear to us. Um, but regardless, Lord, we know that your presence is here, and we just ask for more of you, and we ask for your power to be shown so that your name may be honored and glorified. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 And since you do have a couple more minutes, mm -hmm. well, now why don't you go ahead? I didn't want to take time to. <laughs> no, that's okay. Yeah. So take time to tell us a little bit more about yourself. And, uh, sure. You know, like the background, where you're from, your parents, and, yeah. and even um, your schooling. Yeah. And some of that. Okay, yeah. please. So I grew up in Michigan. Um, I try to not call things pop, and I'm really working on calling it soda. Uh, I moved out here about six years ago uh, to work up at Thousand Pines. And at that point, I didn't really know anything about the mountain, and I quickly fell in love with this community. This, I've never felt more at home than I do in Crestline. Uh, so moving out here, I was kind of just seeking more direction. Uh, I'm the middle of seven children. My parents are both believers, and they raised us in, uh, in, in a Christian home but they, they also sent us to a private school. So I had a lot of hell, head knowledge of who Jesus was, um, but it wasn't until I actually went to summer camp as a 13-year-old that I, the connection between the head knowledge that I had about who Jesus was and the incredible power of having a relationship with Jesus really sunk into my heart. And so I accepted the Lord when I was 13 at camp. Um, I was baptized, I think, when I was 16 um, with my church back home. and. Um, yeah, moving out here was just, it felt I had peace about it, and so I started working at the camp, and I've been there, like I said, for six years, which has been an incredible blessing, but um, two years ago, I started looking into finishing my master's degree, which is in community development and global leadership, and my vision for it with my friends back home was, we're going to go overseas, we're going to end up in Europe somewhere, We'll start a coffee shop. We'll run this ministry through this coffee shop as like a really cool way to like start Bible studies and reach the parts of Europe that are really dark and really, really lost. And so I, and there was no real prompting other than the Lord just saying, it's time to finish your master's. So I went back, did my schooling online, um, which was crazy timing of trying to take on more responsibilities at camp. But I finished last June. And I said, okay, God, I listened, now what? And there was nothing. And so um, we had an awesome summer last year at summer at, at Thousand Pines and then moved into the fall. And I saw some jobs popping up that were interesting, but nothing that really aligned with my vision of what I thought God had. And then um, here we are today in the middle of a pandemic. And I said, okay god i think we're hunkering down i don't think anything really is changing at this point and then i heard from someone that works in the shop that also works at camp she said hey they're looking for a new manager they want someone to be more 
ministry community outreach, you know, minded of developing this, like, this place to be more missional outreach focused. And I said, huh, that sounds a lot like what I wanted to do. And so I called, I got Bill's number. I don't even know how I got your number. Was it Sarah? Yeah. I got his number and I said, hey, I don't know if you're looking for anyone. Can I just drop off my resume? And it's been a really cool journey since then of just saying, yeah, if this is the Lord's will, then, then so be it. And here we are. <laughs> And I do think that that song was appropriate right yeah. before you came, Broken Vessels. Yeah. And here we are. And how are people going to see love if they don't see it in us? Yeah. And that's the point about looking in people's eyes and them being able to see God in us, being able to see God's love in us. And so I hope you'll be praying about as we're in the final stages, literally the final stages. Our board's already met with Andrea. Uh, we're just trying to finalize, finalize some of the details and, and see if this really is who God has called. But boy, she was amazing. Wouldn't it be fun if we could finish her master's? She already has it. But if we could finish her master's in training of turning a coffee shop in a place of outreach so when you go on the mission field <laughs> over there, you've already been on the mission field here. I mean, yes. I think the, your mission field is where you live. And so, yeah, for however long the time is, if, I, if, if this is God's will, I would love to. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, we would love to be a part of that in the future, too. <laughs> so... So thanks, Andrew, for coming. Thanks so much for working it out and the stress of that. And uh, God so bless you. And as you're walking, unless you want to say, um, I just want you to know, um, if you have questions for Andrew, because she can't stay here right now, right. Uh, but if you have questions for her, if you uh, email or text me, I'll pass those on to her so that she can respond to you either by text or email or if, if you want a call or something like that. Uh, since we're online, I'm not going to give her phone number and everything else <laughs> on the, the publicly right now. But you can do that through me, okay, or through the, or through the church, uh, okay? So God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you, everybody.
Have you been enjoying the Psalms this summer and our series on fear? I will not be afraid. I have been. It's a microphone. It's a motorcycle right now, dear. And you have to give your signal to Jonathan to get more volume. <clears throat> so Debbie's wanting more volume, Jonathan. So you could take a microphone back there for her. Now we're getting feedback. <clears throat> God, um, our world wants us to be afraid. It's the way we keep a little child from running into the street when cars are there. We want them to have a healthy fear. It's the way we sometimes show our respect to one another by having a healthy fear of appearance so we don't misbehave. Or even a fear of hurting family members so we work at our, our love, our conversation, we work at forgiving, we work at apologizing because we don't want our, our actions to hurt somebody else and so we're afraid of that. And those are, some of those things are really very healthy. We need a healthy fear that protects ourselves and other people from sickness, and that includes the, the virus. The Lord, there's an unhealthy fear, and you know it. In the coming weeks, we'll talk more about the, the, the value of fearing God and how healthy and how important that is and how we are losing that fear, um, even sometimes in the church. But there's an unhealthy fear, that fear that undermines and destroys and harms. Uh, it's the fear of the dictator that wants to control and rule and uh, the, the fear of the mafia boss who, who wants to take down police officers so that uh, others will not um, hold to ethical standards and, and will not fight against them. Uh, there are so many who want to manipulate with fear Sadly, Lord, politicians even, and, and the press even, and so much going on in our world today that we want to manipulate and control and, and even hurt other people by causing them to be afraid of us. Lord, I pray that we will be people of peace and love, that will show your people your love to this community. pray, God, that you will help us with our fears and our anxieties. In Jesus' name, amen. The portion of Psalm 94 that I'm looking at today, and there's a, we could go through the whole psalm, but obviously there's definitely not time unless you all just want to stay here for a couple of hours. Um, but the verses that I thought were the key to Psalm 94 begin at verse 18 when it says, when I said, my foot is slipping, you're unfailing love Lord supported me when I said my foot is slipping Lord your unfailing love supported me when anxiety was great within me your consolation brought me joy and then verse 22 but the Lord has become my fortress and my God the rock in whom I take refuge the psalmist in this psalm is talking about asking God actually to avenge him and what has happened in his life. He's been going through some tough stuff. People have been trying to crush him, pouring out arrogant words. Evil doers have been boasting against him. In fact, they've even been saying things like this. The Lord does not see the God of Jacob takes no notice. They've been ridiculing God. Said, There's no God out there. He doesn't care. He's not involved. He's dead. And by the way, there's books that say that already. In verse 9 of Psalm 94, it says, Does he who fashioned the ear not hear? By the way, if you want to meditate on something this week, just take these next few verses. Just, just focus on these few verses. Does he who fashioned the ear not hear? Does he who formed the eye not see? Does he who disciplines nations not punish? Does he who teaches mankind 
lack knowledge? Does God know what's going on right now here in this country and around the world? Verse 11, the Lord knows all human plans. He knows that they are futile. And he's going to go on and talk about that. In fact, verse 14 says, For the Lord will not reject his people. He will never forsake his inheritance. God is involved in this world. He hasn't left us. He hasn't ignored us. He's accomplishing his purposes, even through all the things that are happening today. The psalmist asks the question in verse 16, Who will rise up for me against the wicked? Who will take a stand for me against evildoers? Unless the Lord had given me help, I would soon have dwelt in the silence of death. Who's going to really help anybody who gets ill, who's suffering from any kind of illness, but God? So verse 18, when I, my foot is, when I said my foot's slipping, God, I'm in trouble. I'm falling down. Uh, I'm hurting. When I said, my foot is slipping, I have no ability to control what's happening to my life. Your unfailing love supported me. Your unconditional love, your unquestionable love, your love that is always there and always available to me, that love supported me when I was starting to fall down. Our Debbie's uh, aunt and uncle, just before they died the last year, both of them were having problems with, with walking, uh, both of them were having uh, issues with stumbling. And the doctor, and, and, they, and they regularly walked holding hands. And, more, and there was an occasion where they both fell because they were both holding hands. And the doctor finally said, you're not allowed to hold hands anymore. Okay? You can't help one another because you're both going to get hurt in the process. But here's the beauty of God. God can hold our hand, can hold on to us with his unfailing love. And when we're slipping, when we're falling, he's there to catch us and to hold on to us. So when I said, my foot's slipping, God, your unfailing love, Lord, it supported me. And so almost it's going to go on. And, and, and this next one, uh, by the way, I, I call it, I'm, fall, I'm falling. And I can't stop thinking. The psalmist has a really interesting phrase here in verse 19. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. Uh, one theologian, Dr. K, says that the word there for anxiety was our anxious, perplexing, branchings of thoughts, such as continually vex faithful yet doubting souls. What are these? These are, th I can't stop thinking. Have you ever been stressed out and you can't let it go? Or let me give you a different one. Have you ever been ticked and you can't let it go? Mad at somebody and you can't let it go? Get, you, 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 you want them to come and apologize. You want them to come and fix it. You want them to come and work it out. And, and you're sitting here and you're stewing and you're upset and you're thinking, have you ever been there? Have you ever had a negative thought that you just can't let go? And the frustration that you just can't give up? Oh, you see that painting. I did some painting this week at Philip and Jen's house. And I know, I know the spots where it dripped on the wood. And when I go back there, I'll be able to see those spots. And, and unless I pointed them out to you, you probably couldn't find them. But I know, have you ever had a thought that you just can't let go of? That's the anxiety. That's what Psalmist is saying here is that you've got these thoughts that you keep thinking and you're not letting go of, and they're destroying you. And it's part of what's going on in our world today. Our young people are so struggling with anxiety, and the problem is it's not just our young people. It's everybody struggling with so much anxiety, stress, and pressure, and we're thinking and thinking and going over it, and what's it doing to us? For those who are getting angry and upset about what's happening, you want something to get upset about? Debbie told me this morning that now the Governor, Governor Newsom said you can't have small group church, church small groups in your home. Okay? I can come up with a list of things to get you all upset and ticked this morning, right? And some of you don't need me to say that because just by even saying the name Governor Newsom got you thinking and thinking already. You're already on the pathway. The roller course is already moving. The train's going down the track. The horn's already sounding. You're about to crash. And, and you say, I can't stop thinking. And God's trying to say, stop thinking. Listen to what he says. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. When I was thinking way too much about all this stuff, God wants to bring you joy. 
the challenge is, in order for God's consolation to bring us joy, we have to stop thinking. I want you to check your thoughts today. And maybe you've got to do it this week. And you may have to do it every day. And you may have to do it several times a day. Check your thinking. Psalm 139, 23 uses the same word. Listen to what it says. Search me. I think I, no, I didn't put it up there. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. God, examine me. God, check out what I'm thinking. Check out my thoughts, Lord. The thoughts I have. For those of you who think that people aren't protecting themselves well enough, protect, check out your thoughts. For those of you who think there's too many restrictions and you want to get rid of all of them, check out your thoughts. For those of you who are ticked off at your neighbor, your friend, your spouse, somebody who died, check your thoughts. For those of you stressed out on anything, check your thoughts. And Philippians 4 says it this way. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I believe it's been 13 years I've been here. I believe every year in those 13 years I've asked you to memorize Philippians 4, 4 through 9. I think that most of you haven't done it. Haven't followed through with one of the most important prescriptions in all of Scripture. Because it's a, it's a test, it's a scripture medicine that says, here's how you can come against your thoughts, your anxieties, your worries, your fears. Come against it by what? What's Philippians 4, 4 say? Somebody? Rejoice in the Lord always again. I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. And he's going to go on and talk about the fact that with prayer, prayer and thanksgiving, you can make your request to God and what? The peace of God will guard your heart, heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And so therefore, brothers and sisters, finally think about things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy. Check out your thoughts and stop what you're thinking. You see, God so much wants to give you joy. When my anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. How did he also say it? That's the verses I skipped. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer, with thanksgiving, and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And don't forget that this is also the same chapter, just sentences later, when Paul says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. you got to check your thinking. And Jesus Christ will give you the strength to do that. <clears throat> Some of you know the story of Rick and Kay Warren. Uh, Rick is the pastor of Saddleback Community Church uh, in the Saddleback area, Southern California, near the beach. Um, has had an incredible ministry that's developed there over the years, some 40 years now. Just amazing what God has done. Rick and Kay have had some very painful times in their life. Um, in fact, recently their father-in-law became sick with cancer just within the last nine months. Um, and in addition to that, some of you probably don't realize this, but um, Rick and Kay's son committed suicide. And he had fought depression and schizophrenia for years. And they had to deal with that. Kay says, as you know, life is filled with ups and downs. We have mountains and valleys, wins and losses, good times and bad times. We have critics and we have compliments. Of course, you have a choice. Which are you going to focus on? You can walk around looking at all the bad things in your life, or you can go around looking at all the good things. It's your choice. And let me remind you, this is a lady whose son committed suicide. This is not a lady who's got a pie in the sky, by and by kind of attitude that everything's peachy and wonderful and nothing, nothing bad's ever happened to her life. 
This little lady who has experienced pain. In fact, she goes on. It's your choice. Looking at the cup, it is half full or is it half empty? It is your choice. And every day you're making that choice. What are you choosing to focus on? Even on your worst day, life is good. Even on your worst day, you have it better off than many, many other people across the world. You can choose to focus on what is good. She picks up on this thought from Philippians 4, 8. Same thing where she says that Paul gives us a joy builder. Where do you get a list of things like that from Philippians 4, 8? Talk radio? <laughs> no. Television? Not likely. Is that where you're going to find things that are true and admirable and pure? No. The newspaper? Uh-uh. Magazines? No. Um, Facebook? Probably not. Inter Instagram? Uh, you go down the list. TikTok? <laughs> But the reason why you're unhappy a lot of the time is because you get too concerned about trivial issues. The reason you lose your joy so rapidly is that you don't focus on the things that really matter and you allow unimportant things to upset you. How many arguments in your family are really over major issues? You heard the story about the, the husband who said, uh, she takes care of all the minor issues, I take all of the major ones. And they asked the man, well, how many major issues have you had over your life together? They've been married like 40, 50 years. And she, he said, none. How many of the fights that you've had with people, family members, spouses, have been over major issues? Isn't it true that a lot of the conflict in your life, a lot of the killjoys in your life are over inconsequential things that aren't going to matter 30 minutes from now, how much more in an eternity? You see, folks, you can choose what you think. What this means is you can choose to be anxious or you can choose to be happy. You can choose to focus on the negative or to focus on good things. You can choose to think about all the things that might happen due to COVID-19 or what will happen if the election does not go the way you want. You can choose to think about the doctor's appointment. You can choose to think about the disagreement you had with a family member. Or you can choose to think about something good, pure, just, honorable, excellent, true, praiseworthy, something just. There's an old legend about three men who were carrying sacks. Each had his backpack on the front, backpack on the back. The first man talked about his sack, and he said, the sack on the back are all the good things friends and family have done. That way they're hidden from view. The backpack on the front of him were all the things that, um, since I stop, I open up the front sack, I take things out, I examine them, and think about them. They're all the negative things, all the bad things, all the mistakes. Not a good way to go walk around, is it? The good stuff hidden from view and the bad stuff out here and you keep taking them out. And that's what unfortunately some of us are doing with all of our thoughts. The second man was asked about his sacks and in the front sacks he said, are all the good things I've, I've done. I like to see them so quite often I take them out to show them off to people. The, the sack in the back, I keep all my mistakes in there and carry them all the time. Sure they're heavy. They slow me down but you know for some reason I can't put them down. But the third man had it. The third man has a backpack on his front and he says, what's in that? And these are all the things that, all the positive thoughts I have about people, all the blessings I've experienced, all the great things other people have done for me. The weight of this front sack is not a problem. And the back sack? Well, the back sack's where I put all the negative stuff, all my sins, all my, all my failures, all that stuff. But I cut a hole in the bottom of the sack so it's really easy to carry that backpack. What are you doing? Whoops. Okay, I've got mine out of order, but you'll follow me. What are you doing? Are you choosing blessings or are you choosing curses? What are you thinking? I wanted to go into verse 22 and it says, but the Lord has become my fortress and my God, the rock in whom I take refuge. The goal for us to get away from our fears to stop our negative thinking is to get our focus on God, our fortress. 
God who is our refuge. And I have a little acrostic. I think I used this some time back with you, so I'm going to share it with you one more time. And it, it's actually not an acrostic. It's actually, um, how many of you have computers? Anybody have to reformat your drive lately? Anybody have any updates? Anybody have a computer that works too slow? That you're confused how to use it? That you have problems with it? Any mistakes go on? Well, computers are a real challenge. Well, here's some computer language for you. Number one, let the Word of God reformat your thoughts. Some of us need a reformatting, a changing of our thinking, just like our computers do. And Psalm 1, 1 to 3 says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Get into the Word. The Word of God is a tool to reformat your thinking. Secondly, monitor. You know, everyone has a monitor, even on your computer. Monitor what you are thinking. That's Philippians 4, 8. You really need to be checking your thoughts and seeing what you're thinking. The third thing is, if you're not doing this with your computer at home, I really recommend it. It causes a lot less frustration. Save and save often. Especially if you're working on a document and you're moving around doing something else, a long a dissertation or a state or course, right? Save and save often, okay? Same thing is true. Save the word often. Plant it in your heart and in your soul. Jesus said, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then lastly, you got to clean up the cash. you, you got to clean up the garbage. you got to get rid of the trash in your life. And that includes in your computers, too. Some of us have so much stuff there. I, my phone is now tells, starts to tell me sometimes, okay, you got all these windows open in your phone. I didn't know I had windows on my phone. Okay, you got all these windows open. You got 100 windows open, and it's slowing everything down. Well, so, I didn't know that. So I go in there, shut them all down, delete them all out, get them all out of the way. That's about getting your cash out of there. You need to clean your cash off, and 2 Corinthians says it this way. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. You need to get a hold of your thoughts. Take your thoughts captive, and that is about cleaning up your cash. So as I wrap up today, I just want to ask you, what are you thinking about? I read my Bible every day, and, and, and I find myself times when I'm sitting there reading the Bible, and all of a sudden I'm thinking about 30 other things. And I have to stop myself just to read the Bible. What are you thinking about? Because your thoughts are what are harming you and causing you to be afraid. Lord Jesus, I know you want us to be set free. We've talked about it in some of our songs already this morning. You, you want to be our Savior. You want to change us. You want to take that backpack of sins and garbage that we're carrying around, and you want to cleanse it with your blood. And I pray for anyone who hasn't done that today that they would say, God, forgive me of my sins, and I accept the payment that Jesus paid on the cross. And Jesus, I pray that that person would know that they're a new person in you because they do that. And I pray for every believer who's listening and sitting here today who's thinking thoughts that are harming and destroying and beating them up and they need to change those thoughts, Lord. I pray for every one of us that we would stop thinking on the fearful, negative, painful, angry thoughts, but instead we would think on you and receive that joy that you want to give us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As the worship team's coming, if you uh, are online and would like to give to help, we're still doing our food distribution every other week. If you'd like to help with the, the, the ministry of the church, if the, the work goes on, we're getting ready to hopefully hire a minister of outreach and minister of coffee shop, um, you can give online at crestlinefbc.com. There's actually an offering plate over here. That might be strange for, uh, for our times now, right? But we have an offering plate out there if you want to leave an offering there today, too. Also, if you have questions for Andrea, text or call me or leave something there in the offering plate. More than that, go online to our website and leave a prayer request. And by the way, you can leave a prayer request 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 366 days a year. So please do it. Let's finish with our last song.